Hey everybody, this is Micah Burgess. I am a birth doula in Waco, Texas, and you are listening to Game Day Birds Not Balls. Thanks for joining me. I have got a really special guest with me today. I love, 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 love the interview part of what I do on my podcast. And so I have a local OBGYN in the studio with me today, Dr. Michelle Manning. Say hey. Hey, everybody. Tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. My name is Michelle Manning. I'm an OBGYN in Waco, Texas, as Micah said. I am a local girl. I grew up in Waco, um, graduated from Lorena High School, and um, went to Baylor University, um, moved to Houston for med school, and University of Alabama at Birmingham wow. for residency, which was really fun um, and a great training. Um, my husband's an anesthesiologist, so we did residency together, mm -hmm. and then as quick as I could, I came home. And I've been working here since 2005. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Family? Uh, like I said, I have my husband. He is met the love of my life in medical school. And mm -hmm. we got married uh, about three months before we started residency. Wow. Whereupon we both worked 120 hours a week. <laughs> That's uh, a for great the first way to start year. a marriage. Yeah. Well, it makes your honeymoon period a lot longer <laughs> because you only see each other about every third night. There we go. Yeah. So, um, but we, I mean, we survived it. We got stronger and, and it was good. And then um, about, mm, it was February. We were supposed to move back to Waco in July. We had our first baby. That's a story I'll have to tell you in a minute. I want to hear it. So we have a 17-year-old son and a 14-year-old son and a 11-year-old little girl. Okay. Yeah. I knew about the boys. I don't know how I missed that you had a, a daughter. I oh, my gosh. 11-year-old going on 18 and <laughs> the boss of everybody. It's a totally different ballgame, isn't it, uh, with the yes, girls? It's yes, like Everybody talks about boys and how loud and rambunctious, but it's like they're so easy. Like, just... Send them outside to play. Totally agree. Girls, it's not quite that simple. Yeah, yeah, The yeah. first time the two-year-old crossed her arms and turned her back, mm -mm. I was like, huh, <laughs> she's never seen me do that. She didn't talk to me for 30 minutes, and she was only two. I oh mean, my it's different. It's so different. It's so different. I love that you said that. Okay, so I love that you're a really a waco in. Mm -hmm. So cool. So am I. I graduated from Waco High. Um, and so I love talking with people who've been here forever. Can you – believe and get over the changes no just even walking downtown to come to the studio yeah. i was like look at this this looks like a real downtown right? it's awesome i love it i've loved watching waco grow especially i think over the last five years mm -hmm. has been amazing mm -hmm. it's really cool it is and do you find this to be true people either like when they come to let's say baylor um and they go to school here you either absolutely love adore waco or you hate it and can't stand it I feel like there's very few like middle ground people that are here it's really true and actually I was going to go anywhere but Baylor okay. because I grew up in such a small mm -hmm. town Lorena I think I graduated with 77 people and so I was like I'm going to go to the northeast and I'm going to go to Boston I'm going to get all this culture mm -hmm. and then Baylor had the best scholarship and I was like yes please I'll take that uh -huh. and so I stayed and my husband's from Dallas and he went to Baylor but we didn't know each other during college okay. and so when he left Waco he was never coming back and so when we <laughs> started dating and um it got serious he was like I'm never living in Waco again you just need to know that because my whole family's here like yeah. extended extended and um we, we the best job offer was here and wow. it was more family centered than it mm -hmm. was make a ton of money mm -hmm. and he said let's move to Waco and I was like can you sign something <laughs> right now and I'm gonna hold you to it and but we've been so happy to be here yes. we're not dealing with the traffic in Dallas oh, and the cost of living and right. Anyway, it's been great to raise kids. It really is mm -hmm. a great place to raise your family. Yeah, you're right about that. That's so true. Okay, tell me and our listeners what drew you to the OBGYN route. Yeah, so I went, I always knew I was going to be a doctor. Okay. I was going to medical school from the time I was very young. Um, first of that, I want to be a veterinarian, but then I decided that was too many anatomy physiologies to learn. Mm -hmm. So I'd just concentrate on one, just be a human doctor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, when I got to medical school, uh, the classes that just drew my attention were the pharmacology of the birth control. Mm -hmm. And it just was fascinating to me how a woman's body could take this egg and mm -hmm. the sperm. And then like, there was this person and 
the way that it healed afterwards. And it just mm-hmm. was very fascinating. And it didn't really translate into, I want to be an ob I thought I was going to be um, a neonatologist. I wanted to take care of the okay. itty-bitty babies. And did my first pediatrics residency. I was like, nope, this is not for me. I didn't like pediatrics. Yeah. I didn't like taking care of kids. Mm. It was veterinary medicine, right? They can't tell you what's wrong with them. And they cry yeah. as soon as they see you. I was like, this is not for me. Got and then it. I did my OB residency. And I was just like, first delivery. I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Yeah. 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 So cool. It, it's still, I mean, you know, you and I get to see people being born all the time. And, and it's hard to explain to people, this is kind of life changing. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, every time it, everybody should see a baby be born. Seriously. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you get so in touch with humanity. You get so in touch with miraculous. Yeah. It's just a miracle every time. Every the healthiest, time. most normal births are still just an incredible miracle. And that's 15 years in. And I don't even know how many hundreds mm. of babies I've delivered. Probably thousands at this point. I'm sure it is. But I just think every time it's like, this is so cool. This mm. little person just became part of this new family. And you see the parents' faces and it doesn't matter if it's their first kid or their seventh kid. It's like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is ours. You know, it just, it's cool. It's a it's a great job. It's it and it's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows because my job is mm. fabulous until it's not, and then it's the worst. And yeah. so, you know, you get both parts of that. But either way, you get to walk women through these experiences mm. and try and make sure that they can process them, good and bad, yeah. um, in order to be healthy on the other side of it. So I really enjoy that part of it too, the lifelong relationships. Mm. I think that's fun. That's so good that you had that because not every doctor wants that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's true. My husband doesn't. Yeah. It's like, so he picks something different. I'm mm-hmm. out. Like I'm done. Yep. But the continuing to see people, you know, they keep coming back mm-hmm. to you, you mm-hmm. know, because they love their experience and they want whoever was in that birthing room with their very first child. Like, yeah, can we recreate that? I want all of those people in there. Yeah. Um, supporting me. And yeah, you get to follow this family along and, and they're there. Not because they're sick. Right. Typically, Typically. I'm sure you have people, obviously, that are coming to see you for things that are that are wrong, right? Mm-hmm. But for the most part, they're not sick. They're having yeah. a baby, which is, man. Yeah. And, I'm, and I really like it. You know, Waco is a small town, and so you get these um, teenagers that I, you know, I'm seeing mm-hmm. in high school and just kind of developing yeah. relationships with. And then they disappear for four years when they're in college, and then they come back, and I get to, yeah. you know, find out that they got married. And then we go through those deliveries, and it just is really cool. It is. It's super personal, very relational, and I'm so glad you're doing it. Okay, what do you think for women when they come and see you, they're pregnant, What do you feel like their biggest concern tends to be surrounding their birth experience? So I'm going to take that question in a sort of a slightly different direction. I think that every woman's anxiety is slightly different, right? So I don't think they have like one overriding concern. But what I've noticed, especially in the last 10 years, I think, Mm -hmm. is this deep-seated anxiety that it's not going to go right, yeah. But whose definition is right? Yep. And so they're reading all this stuff mm. um, on these blogs and on Facebook and on the Internet, just mm-hmm. all these different places. And it's like you have to do it this way or you're going to damage your baby forever. Right. Mm. They're not going to be able to bond or they're not going to, you mm-hmm. know, their IQ is not going to be higher, whatever it is. But right. there's so much information yeah. and so many opinions that are yes. very mutually exclusive. Right. Like you can't. Yeah be a good mom if you do this, but then you look on another page and it's exactly the opposite. Mm-hmm. And so there's this fear of messing up. I You're think it's so probably right. the the biggest thing I see. And I, traditionally, I think humans were meant to live in community. Yeah. And so our moms and our aunts and our grandmas taught us how to raise our babies, mm-hmm. but we don't have that. And then COVID has separated everybody yeah. out, even from their friends. And so the friends that would come over and help you breastfeed yeah. or tell you that it's okay that you're not sleeping yet, mm. they're gone mm-hmm. or they're just now starting to reform. So we've had this group mm-hmm. of women over the last two or three years that didn't even have their close friends that could help them through that right. newborn part and that pregnancy part. So I think the fear of making a mistake or the fear sure. of something being done wrong early mm-hmm. on is the biggest thing I see. So I just try and remind, especially new moms, but even the other ones, you know what? This is your baby. Mm -hmm. This is your birth experience. This is not anybody else's call on how it's supposed to go, on whether you should have an epidural, on whether you should have a C-section, on whether you should, you know, this is your birth experience. You're the only one that's going to feel this. Mm -hmm. And so quit reading all that stuff. 
figure out what you need, figure out what's going to make you feel complete. And then Mm -hmm. that's what we should do. Yeah. Because that's important. Absolutely. And when we talk to clients, I mean, one of the very first things I tell them is, okay, first of all, you need to trust your caregiver Mm -hmm. 100% with your life and your baby's life. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) But we have a big problem. Okay. So you have to trust your caregiver. Secondly, there's so much information out there, like you said. But beyond that, so many opinions yes. and soapboxes out there about the way mm-hmm. um, to do something. And I don't know why our society feels like that that's okay when it comes to parenting. They're, very strongly. They feel you know, very strongly. It's, it's like, important. wait, there's so much. I feel like our society, for the most part, about most things, is like, oh, gosh, there's so many options, y'all. And you can't do it. But not uh not when it comes to this. It's yeah. like. People really do believe there is a way, a certain way. And like you said, and you're going to mess you about it. it up if you don't do it that way. So we encourage our clients, hey, listen, you need to really shorten your list mm-hmm. of people that you want to listen to in this process of pregnancy and childbirth, maybe even on into postpartum and breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. And those need to be the people that you see in your life and you appreciate what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You see some results and you like um, how that shows up on yeah. them and what their kids are like or how they're parenting or whatever. Pick their brains mm-hmm. about what they're going to do. But just randomly Googling something you is can really not going to be- yeah. benefit you. I had one girl that was trying to read four different OB books, like four mm-hmm. different pregnancy books. And she she was like, I'm getting behind on my reading and I haven't gotten into the seventh month yet because I've only read the sixth month and two of the oh, books. Gosh. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, take a breath. <laughs> pick one. Pick the one that the mm-hmm. voice you like the best of how they write and then go with that yeah. and put the other three away because you're stressing yourself out. And yes. it's not supposed to be stressful. No. It's supposed to be wonderful and it happy is. and magical. And we just get so overwhelmed. But you're right. I, How about let's talk to our moms a little bit more and ask them. And may, maybe they didn't have a great at birth experience right. and maybe they're not a great resource for you or maybe they stress you out, <laughs> yeah, which is <laughs> totally legit. But making it a little bit more personal, a little bit more, um, I don't know. I just keep wanting to say human. That computer is not human, and maybe a human wrote that article. But when you talk to somebody face-to-face and yeah. and can really get into the details about the questions that you have or, hey, which way should I go, then it becomes a little bit more real Yeah, and not just a bunch of information. Out there. Right, right. And I love research. Like I have patients come in that ask mm-hmm. some really great questions. Mm-hmm. I like the people that have researched and come in with questions instead of researching and coming in with answers mm-hmm. because there's that depth of knowledge that's different from a breadth of knowledge. So you can know yeah. a whole lot about a topic um, on the surface, but if you don't know all the physiology beyond that, the mm-hmm. deeper layers, sometimes it can lead you to a wrong conclusion. So I love researchers. I love for them to bring all their questions in and go, hey, this is what I read. You know, what do you think? Let's talk about this. Let's work yeah. towards a plan that we're both comfortable with, which I like that too. Yeah, I do too. So do you find, I mean, again, as a birth doula, I typically see the same type of of expecting mom in terms of the kind of birth experience that she wants. Now, whether we end up going with that 100%, with, that remains yeah. to be seen. Right. It remains to be seen what your body's going to do, what your baby's going to do, and what yep. your birth dictates, right? Yep. But sure, let's shoot for that goal. So mm-hmm. I know the type that I see. Are you finding, do you find trends like, yeah. wow, now, now this is what women tend to want? Or is it still just a hodgepodge and you just never know what you're going to get? You know, what I, do you know what I'm asking? I do. Okay. And I think, I think there, you do see trends, but I think they're small. I think you okay. will always have that hodgepodge. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got people who want convenience. You've got people who want the most, the safest thing they can do. You've got people that want the most non-interventional. Mm-hmm. So I think you have that hodgepodge all the time. I think we're um, seeing an awareness that, that our bodies were made to do this. And mm-hmm. so I have a lot of the, kind of mid twenties that are coming in more with the, I kind of want a non-interventional birth as much yeah. as possible. We still have tons of people that want an epidural. We sure. still have tons of people that want to repeat C-section. And again, all those are fine. Absolutely. It's what, you know, what makes your world right. So absolutely. And we're actually seeing, it's so funny. We're actually getting more clients that they don't necessarily just want this all natural experience. No interventions. Like they, Hey, I just, so you know, I will be getting the epidural. Great. Okay. But they still want our support there because they're scared out of their minds about birth. And I just 
want a hand holder. You know, yep. I just want someone to yep. help me go through the process and to support me, yes, physically, but then, you know, how should I be thinking about this right. when it happens? Not necessarily the advice up front or the medical advice because right. we sit, we tell them, that's why you trust your caregiver 100% because they are giving you the med- medical yeah. advice. And we're there to encourage you that everything's okay even when it shifts. Yeah. Even when we've got to maybe cross a bridge you didn't want to cross it's okay let's shift our perspective because your baby's still going to be born today right in, in some way or another and i tell moms you know <laughs> growing a baby to mm. delivery that's your superpower totally. like how it comes yes. out mm, that's just part of the story mm-hmm. but the superpower is that you made this kid right mm. and so you have to be ready for those babies to make those shifts and those jumps but i do think that the support person in labor and delivery whether it's a doula or a mom or the yeah. husband who's right. a great communicator yes. you know whoever it is i think those encouraging supportive people are what's going to keep people from having that kind of traumatic birth experience where they feel like they didn't understand what was Mm -hmm. going on and they didn't want what happened and nobody explained it to them. So I think that really strong support person, however it manifests is really Mm -hmm. important for women. Yeah, that is, you hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned that our goal is a positive birth Mm -hmm. experience, less trauma. Now that doesn't mean there are not, traumatic situation right. there are it's how you process it yeah it's how you it's handle how you it. process mm-hmm. it exactly right exactly right um okay so talk about your birth experiences i would love to hear well there is a, an old saying that there's a nurse curse right so if you work in a hospital <laughs> you will not have anything be uncomplicated so i'm an ob my husband's anesthesia i was like i'm never gonna get an epidural which was fully my plan mm-hmm. um so we got pregnant with plans to deliver a few months before we left birmingham like maybe two um i think uh, jonathan's birthday was supposed to be in february and i had come home to visit my grandmother who was on hospice and actually she passed away while I was home that weekend. Mm. And so I was really glad that I was here with my mom and, yeah. but I just felt kind of funny. Um, and at that point I was, it was November. So I was 26 weeks pregnant mm. and ended up, my husband drove in um, from Alabama to come in for the funeral. And we were watching a presidential election as I recall. And I wow. went, I think I need to go to the hospital. He was like, why? And wow. I'm like, ah, I think something's wrong. And he was like, you're an obstetrician. Is something wrong or is it not? And I'm like, well, if it's not, they're going to make fun of me because it's silly. (laughs) But if it is, it could be really wrong. And he was like, all right, let's go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you're going to have this baby probably in the next, you know, 24 or 36 hours. And I'm like, oh, I can't. It's very small. Um, And it just so happened that the person that was on call that night was um, my uh, mentor Mm. through med school and um, college um, are we allowed to say sure. names on the program? Okay. So it's Dr. Haskip. Yes. And he saw that I was about to lose my mind and he was, mm. you know, kind of wanted to click me back into doctor mode. And he's like, you need to tell your husband what's going on. You need to tell him what the plan of care is. And so I had to tell my husband that we had a 50% chance of taking this kid home and mm. a 50% chance of losing him and, wow. um, what the NICU stay was going to look like. And it was, that was traumatic. Um, mm. so I was transferred to another hospital with a higher level nursery. Yeah. And we delivered our one pound, 12 ounce baby, uh, 36 hours later with no epidural. I knew that was going to (laughs) happen. Not my birth plan. Um, but he was just had the best care. Um, he did great. It took us about three months to get him home. Mm -hmm. So we got him home and we're like, okay, we're never having children again. Like that was (laughs) too scary. I mean, we were on our knees every day, just praying that God would let us keep this baby. You know, can we just keep him? We'll take good care of him. Now he's 17. I'm like, Mm. I prayed for this baby. He's going to be great. (laughs) (laughs) Never mind yourself that with teenagers. But um, but he's awesome and he's great and he just no problems. I mean, he's just a good kid. And so we weren't going to have any more because we didn't want that to happen again. Wow. And then he turned two and we were like, oh, my gosh we have to have a friend for this child because (laughs) he's very verbal and very active. So we got pregnant again. I ended up um, with a cerclage uh, to try and prevent that early delivery and bed rest for, Oh wow. So I went on bed rest at 24 weeks and got admitted to the hospital at 30 weeks and had Caleb at 32 weeks. Wow. And so we were like, Oh, this is great. We only have to be in the NICU for two weeks this time. So we took him home and I said, "Um, I think I want to have, you know, I want to, I want to have another baby. And my husband went, Mm, I don't know. He went, and I'm not helping you try for a girl. I was like, what? What? <laughs> he said, I'm not helping. He goes, if you want a third child, I'm all in. 
He goes, but if you're going to try for a girl, mm. I don't want any part of that because I don't want you to be disappointed. Like every baby wow. should be celebrated. You know, I was like, ooh, that kind of mm. cuts a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I had to go think about it. Yeah, you did. And it took me about six months. And I came back and went, you know what? I really feel like three is the right number for our family. I just want another baby. He was like, sweet, let's go. So <laughs> that's amazing. We got pregnant. I got a circlage. I went to bed. Um, and Meredith, to, she was a good little girl, stayed put until 37 weeks. Wow. Um, and was induced. And she's fabulous. And they're all healthy and wonderful and really the reason I do everything I do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You, I'm sure we've had this conversation before, but my baby, who's now 13, was also a micro preemie baby. Mm-hmm. And uh, 25 weeks. Mm-hmm. bleeding, no amniotic fluid anymore. They thought I was in your situation, like I was going to go into labor at any moment, got transferred to a different hospital so that they could care for him. But I stayed pregnant for two weeks. Oh, that's crucial at that age. Two mm, crucial. weeks with mm-hmm. basically no amniotic fluid, Yeah, essentially. Bed rest, of course. Um, but then ended up with an emergency C-section because I'm losing my clotting factors now. Ooh. And obviously. Dangerous. Yeah, yeah. we don't want to bleed out anyway so very similar but mine was last so I can totally understand what you're saying if it's the first one it'd be like oh hey on that one yeah doing that, no, 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 no. Like, that is a big that's trauma mm-hmm. it, it has served me well I'm gonna tell you both experiences um it has helped me be way more compassionate mm-hmm. and at the end of the day I'm able to help these women process when they feel disappointed like my body failed me or what did yes. I do wrong? Or they didn't let me, la, la, la. whatever it is. I just want to go. Can I just say that when your child turns two, yeah, you will not look at this child and go, dang it. I didn't get the birth I wanted. Like yeah. you're just not going to do that. Right. They're here. They're alive. They're well. Yeah. And so let's put this in the proper right. perspective. Yep. You yeah. know, no, I totally agree. I felt very guilty for, months and months Mm. after Jonathan was born that I'd done something wrong and that was why he had come knowing like medically knowing that that wasn't true but my mama heart was like Mm. he should be inside he shouldn't be where they're having to you know draw blood and all this stuff and then with um the other two well with Meredith I went into uh my cervix shortened at like 23 weeks or 22 and a half and so I started bed rest a little early but my thought was what am I going to do here we're at peri viability you know you know, what are we going to put this kid through? I mean, there's just so many questions. And then when she was born term Mm. and they got to put her on my chest, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. And so I think that helps with the idea that every single birth is a miracle. So all these term babies that people were like, oh, that was a healthy birth. I'm Mm. like, you have no idea how special that is, right? Like so true. So important that that went well. So I agree. I think it's uh, really guided a lot of the conversations that I have with my patients. And I know when I put people on bed rest and they're not doing it because they come in smiling. (laughs) Because <laughs> bed rest sucks. sucks. It absolutely does. One hundred percent. Are you crazy? You just put me in bed. Do you know who I am? Do you know that I, I got so Stuff much to do? do. Yes. Like you don't live life in a bed. But Nuts. like you said, you don't look back and think, Oh, I wish mm-hmm. I'd had two more months at work. You look back uh-uh. and go, I'm so glad I was pregnant yes. for two more months or you know, whatever the case may be. But yes. it does, it gives you perspective. So I apologize when I put people on better. So I'm like, I'm so sorry, but so sorry, but <laughs> yeah, you gotta you go. can complain to me. I'll listen all day long. I will listen but all I'm day not long. Changing what my uh, diagnosis is here. Okay. Shifting a little bit. Do you have a I don't know, favorite birth story or scenario that you like just really enjoyed or you like telling this particular instance when you're at the dinner. It's just a, I don't know, just a fun, lighthearted or even funny, whatever. Yeah. I have, well, I probably have about three of those that I really like, but one of my favorites that just is kind of a heart touching one is I have a patient who's had several surrogate pregnancies. Mm. So she had her babies and they were all healthy and she's a great pregnant person. Um, and so she wanted that gift for others. So one of the pregnancies, the parents, I think had lost four pregnancies prior to like their own, like mom had been pregnant, miscarried, like it was awful. Mm. And they were like, we can't emotionally go through that again. So now we've done the surrogate pregnancy. I've gone through this nine months with my um, patient. I've met the, um, parents to be and they've come to several of the visits and so now we're in the delivery room and so I've got my patient and her husband at the bedside and then the warmer is over sort of against the wall in our delivery rooms and the parents to be are kind of there by the warmer mm-hmm. and I sort of have a pattern that I follow with delivery so I 
you know, delivered the baby and I held it up and I said, it's a healthy boy, girl. I don't even remember what the baby was, but Mm -hmm. held it up. And my automatic, you know, reaction is to hand it to the mom that I've just delivered. And so I kind of, you know, cut the cord and I went to offer the baby to mom and she shook her head at me and met my eyes Mm. and nodded her head towards the the (laughs) baby's parents. And I was like, you're right. And I turned and the look on their faces as they are looking at this child that they have waited and prayed and wept and just Mm. desired with everything that they are and it's being handed to them and tears were just streaming down both their faces and the mom just reached out her hands and you could tell she was like, I can't even believe that this is my baby. And so that, that is something that has stuck in my mind for a long time. Uh, That was an amazing one. Uh, And then I had one where I was delivering a friend of mine, like we've been to wine nights, Mm -hmm. you know, just a good friend. Yeah. And it was sort of a, one of those accidental blessing pregnancies Mm -hmm. where it was a surprise at the end. And she was laboring and she went through labor great and she's a little bit of an older mom so she'd been really uncomfortable and you know hips hurt back hurt and I'm thinking it's a really big baby mm. but I didn't want to say anything because I don't want to stress her out so we deliver and the kid hits my hands and I'm like holy cow that's a <laughs> big kid and the dad looks at me and goes that baby's huge <laughs> and the little bitty mama sits up in bed and looks me straight in the eyes and goes did you know that <laughs> And I went, yeah, kind of. She was like, why didn't you tell me that? And I look over at him and he's like, thank you so much for not telling her that. Wow. <laughs> like it just would have stressed her out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that was just kind of That's a funny great. one where it was That's more personal. But I, I mean, I love what I do. I love being in the delivery room. And you're very good at it. I get to work with Dr. Thank Manning you. and she is one of my favorites. And so that brings us to your new up and coming big news. Please tell everybody what's up. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I um, I've been in a large group practice for all of my career Mm -hmm. and love it. Love those doctors. Think they are fabulous. Um, But I am very chatty um, and my patient volume was getting really big and I didn't feel like I was getting to spend the time that I wanted to with each individual patient. So I am blessed in that my husband has a great job and Mm -hmm. I'm not a sole breadwinner. And so I went to him and said, hey, I really feel called to just do my own thing can we do that and he looked at it um and said well as long as you're not gonna like retire I'm like I'm not retiring this is what (laughs) I love to do he said yeah go do it he goes you gotta make some money eventually but we can survive a little while while you get it set up great and so we opened complete women's care of Waco on January the 4th um one of my patients that I'd seen before leaving my old practice called and said look I have an appointment with you on the 11th Mm. I don't think I'm going to be pregnant that long I really want to come in to see you so that I can um Mm -hmm. deliver with you and so she came in and saw us on Tuesday morning she was our very first patient at nine o'clock opening day oh my gosh and her water broke three days later and she was my first delivery with my new practice I know she just knew mom just knew yeah yeah and so yeah so it's a two exam room office I've got one front desk staff I've got one nurse both of whom are just fabulous personalities and I am loving it oh I am so happy for you I'm really happy getting to do what you want to do and the way you want to do it and more personalized yeah so tell people what they should expect what they're gonna get from you your clinic what kind of care what do you want them to know about you yeah so I see my role as a provider as an educator as well as a physician right Mm -hmm. so women now don't need me to tell them what they need to do Mm-hmm. Right. It's just not the society that we live in. So mm-hmm. I feel like my job is to keep up to date on what's the current technology, what's the current medical advice, because that changes, yeah. you know, with regularity and just to be able to say, OK, here are the options. Um, this is what the risks of each one of them would be. This is the benefits. What do you think works better for you? So I That's feel good. like our relationship is a conversation where mm-hmm. I make sure you have all the pieces that you need to make the right decision so for good. your individual situation because so nobody's situation is the same so I, f- I feel like it's a cooperative kind of an effort between the two of us and I would say I had to sit down with some marketing people they're like we need your thoughts on why you're doing this yeah. and what you're doing and so in that conversation it came out I feel like there's like two tiers to um this 
practice that I've opened. So I want one of them to be built on that patient education, really being able to listen to people and go, why do you not think that's a good idea? Mm. Because I clearly feel like that's the right thing for you. So what's Mm -hmm, going on? And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you'll get stories from people about why that's really not good for them. And you're like, oh, well, I totally understand that. Okay, let's just put that on the shelf and like Mm -hmm. keep talking about these other options. So I want patients to feel heard. Good. Um, I want them to feel like they have the power. Our tagline is empowering women to wellness because I want them to feel like they have the information they need to make those decisions and they have referrals to dietitians or pelvic floor therapists or counselors or whatever it is they need to make them well. Um, I want to be able to offer that. So that's the patient tier or the patient peer, I guess. And then the other basis is um, I listened to a podcast from a um, physician named Sunny Smith, and she does Empowering Women Physicians. Um, And there's part of the Hippocratic Oath that says that we promise to have the utmost respect for human life and its quality. And we Mm. take that when we're our first year medical student. And she kind of twisted it and said, we need to be to have respect for the quality of our lives. We need to have the utmost respect for our life and its quality. And so I think medicine right now is very, it's changing all the time, clearly, Mm -hmm. but it's hard. And so I think a lot of times we have to pick as women, whether you're the nurse or the front desk staff or the physician of, am I going to be a good mommy today? Or am Mm. I going to be a good doctor? Or am I going to be a good wife? And I don't really want people to have to choose. So I want to create a space where people can come work because there are some incredible women physicians out there who want to be mommies and they want to be wives. Um, There's nurses who are getting torn, you know, I need these hours, but I want to do this. And so I want to create a place where people are able to do all three of those um, well. And so, so, you know, so we're not going to be as busy and we're not going to make as much money, Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to be a little bit more fulfilled and we're maybe going to extend our careers a little bit where before we were going to burn out and quit at 45. Ooh, burnout's a thing. It's a real thing. It's a real thing among nurses. It's a real thing among doctors. I mean, it's probably a real thing among everybody, but that's who I hang out with. So, right, right. The birthing world for sure, because of the whole (laughs) on call scenario Mm -hmm. and you don't know when a mom is going to have her baby. And so. Yeah, you don't get to decide all the time to be a nine to five. It's three a.m. Yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. yeah, and so that that part can be challenging, right? But if you're allowed, if it's told to you that it's okay that you only do that three days a week, mm. um, which I was told my entire career, I had fabulous um, male partners who were like, "We get it. We totally get it. If you take equal call, you can work three days a week," and that was really good for me. Mm. Um, and so I want to create a space where that's okay, and you can see the number of patients that you can take care of, and recognize that you're not going to take home the same paycheck but that's okay that's sometimes okay. yeah yeah mm-hmm. doing what you feel like you so that, to that's do. that's what I want for my staff that's what I want for my patients so that's what we're kind of based on so complete women's care of Waco empowering women to wellness so so great okay so is that what how people are going to find you right they're just going to google yes. complete women's care no maybe in about three weeks okay great. yeah i'm facebook. just waiting for my website to go live facebook has it on there we have complete women's care of waco and hopefully they're going to attach my name to that soon because i've got some patients that are yeah. looking for me and can't find me yes they've already reached out to me <laughs> Dr. <Mandy. laughs> they're like micah where is she and i'm like okay i i'm 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 in the process i'm hunting her down i promise like this all just happened i will find her and i'm so happy that they're finding me i really i do i like my patients so it's really awesome when i see a face in the waiting room because it's so small Mm -hmm. i can like look around the corner and see them and uh and go oh you found us and they're like yes we did so that's so great hopefully we're gonna make it easier soon yes so if you're in the waco area and you can't find complete women's care you can find her on our site as well my doula micah and um, uh, Waco doula, we've got, we featured her on our, uh, Instagram a couple of days ago. So fun. So yeah, we, we've got our information. If you can't hunt her down, we'll hunt her down for you. I guess so. that means I have to get an Instagram account, huh? You kind of <laughs> do. I mean, I just started, I'm like 50 years old and I just started last year. And you know, it's weird. I'm sure my kids could set it up for me. That's it. That's, <laughs> that is totally it right there. And then now it's the. Mom, you got to do more videos. Mom, you got to get on TikTok. Mom, you need a new YouTube channel. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, (laughs) what is my life right now? This is so far removed from what I actually do. I'm just. You are doing what women do best, and that is multitask. Oh, my. Well, hopefully I'm doing some of it well. I'm pretty confident many things are falling (laughs) through the cracks, but hopefully I'm 
checking a few boxes that I'm doing a couple things. I feel well. like people are pretty happy with your services. So I think Thank we're doing good. You. Thanks for saying that. Well, I have loved this conversation. I'm so, so happy, Fun. so excited about what you're doing and what you're offering. And yeah, if you are in the Waco, Texas area, please, please, please check out Dr. Manning and what she has to offer. She's amazing at what she does. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to give you her phone number. Yeah, go for it. You know oh, it. So our phone number is 254-236-2929, and that's CWCW, Complete Women's Care of Waco. And um, our website's easy, too. It's www.cwcwaco.com. Perfect. Good. And we'll have an awesome website when it goes up. We've got uh, the Starving Artist is doing our um, marketing, and they have done a phenomenal job. Great. Yeah, so it's going to be good. Good. Looking forward to that, too. Looking forward to that, too. Thanks again for Thanks joining me. Thanks for having me, me Micah. You're it was welcome. fun. Hey, thanks for joining me on Game Day, Birds Not Balls. You can follow me on my Instagram page at MyDoulaMica. You can also find me on WagoDoula.com. WagoDoula is on Facebook. And if you like what you heard, you can subscribe or you can find us on RogueMediaNetwork.com. Thanks for joining us. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.